So, uh, <laughs> it was all good. Anyways, yeah. So that turns out to be what yes. you have written. Yes. yes. So, so I found all this wonderful documentation on, on the, his studio up in the Bronx in Morrisania. And, uh, and, and cause he had four brothers, and they were all from Carrara, where Carrara Marble's from. And it turned out American sculptors didn't know how to fabricate their own sculptures. That I mean, even like the Lincoln and the Lincoln Memorial was done by a European. I mean, that is, an American would think it up and make a little tiny maquette, but then it'd have to be executed by a European, because no American was clever enough to be able to actually pound the mallet on the marble and make those huge things. But, uh, but Picciarelli, whose father had been doing that for Americans, over in Carrara, he had the, the wit to move here with his four brothers, they all had marvelous names, and to set up this great um, atelier in the Bronx where he would then execute all these important public sculptures. And they get these, but he's connected with the mafia, the mafia. Row, and then so we get this. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> very exciting. <laughs> it's very exciting. Anyway, it was wonderful. <laughs> hard, hard to uh, make that leap, though, that that you make so wonderfully well, uh, just to, uh, I was, I found it very helpful, my uh, fellow countryman, the uh, Nobel Prize winner, J.M. Quincy, gave me a good piece of advice with this historical fiction. I was telling him actually about another, uh, the previous book, which was um, Bluebird, which was based on the life of a French aristocrat who comes to this country uh, during the revolution. And I told him about this project and he sort of looked rather worried, and then he said to me, don't stay too close to the truth. Uh, and I thought that was uh, really very good advice in a way, just to kind of get yourself out of the clutches of too much research. It doesn't seem to have been your, your problem though, Ed. <laughs> well, I mean, I had a, I had a, <laughs> well, I had a peculiar situation because um, there, there was one page written by a friend of, of Stephen Crane, who was notoriously unreliable and a famous liar. I mean, Crane had the odd uh, situation of having the two first people who really wrote about him, Thomas Beer, who wrote his first biography, and Honecker, who was a well-known cultural critic of the period, both were tremendous liars. <laughs> uh, and so they made up all this stuff. I mean, like, Beer in his biography of Crane uh, would sort of stole the whole market so nobody else bothered to write uh, a, a biography of Crane for the first 40 years. It turned out all the letters that he quotes from, from Crane to various people were written by Beer. They found them in his handwriting. And I mean, it, anyway, there are a lot of weird things like that. So, uh, but, but anyway, one of these two liars uh, left a, a, a page in his handwriting in which he said, I was walking up Broadway today with Stephen Crane and a boy prostitute approached us and uh, when we got to Union Square and the boy uh, looked very hungry and, and almost fainted and Crane had no idea what his game was. He was so naive that he had no idea that, that homosexuality existed. But anyway, he felt sorry for the boy, he took him in and bought him a meal at this uh, fancy hotel restaurant. Yeah, that's a wonderful start to the book. And then, and then he realized that uh, the boy, um, uh, what, he realized that he was a prostitute, and he and Crane was fascinated by female prostitutes. He married one, a woman who who had a bordello called Hotel de Dream in uh, Jacksonville, Florida, and he loved prostitutes. I mean, that was his thing. But but he didn't know about male prostitutes. <laughs> So he thought this was terribly interesting, and he decided to write a novel about it. But then one of his best friends, um, uh, Hamlin Garland, who was a sort of hairy-chested uh, heterosexual writer, said, if you continue writing this, you'll never have a career. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I thought, wouldn't it be interesting? So he tore it up very reluctantly. But I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if he hadn't, if he had finished it? And then I thought, well, I'll write it. Yeah. <laughs> so it was sort of to fill this kind of empty niche in the life of a well-known person that inspired me to write the I book. I see, yes. Well, I think often it is that. I mean, what, what got me going with the, with the um, Jane Eyre 
was uh, a line in a, a biography by Lyndall Gordon, who's a South, also a South African, and she wrote a wonderful biography of Charlotte Bronte uh, called A Passionate Life. Some of you are not in your head, so maybe you, you know it. Um, but there was a line in there that said, um, nobody knows what happened in that dark room when Charlotte sat by uh, her father's bedside and she wrote, anyway, half of Jane Eyre in those six weeks. Uh, she, um, she wrote up to where Jane leaves Thornfield, um, which, you know, just absolutely remarkable. Uh, so I thought, uh, well, nobody knows, but I, I want to find out. So it was that sort of crevice or that, that thing that you don't know, I think, yes. and that's often, isn't it what gets you going on something? Even if it's uh, something in your own life about your parents or some, something in your life. Something you, mysterious that, yes. to you, even. Right, that you want to sort of find out on the page. Uh, so that's interesting. So that's yes. what got you going on this. And what, there's a scene, I was wondering if it really happened, where um, the... Uh, where um, Emily Bronte and Anne get an acceptance letter right, right. from a yes, publisher. Yes, yes, that is absolutely true. They sent out the, they had, you know, they had each one written a book. Charlotte had written The Professor, which was rather a dull, I don't know, have any of you read The Professor? I don't want to malign it, but it's not anything, as not nearly as good as Jane Eyre. So she'd written that. Emily had written Wuthering Heights. Uh, or part of it anyway, uh, and Anne had written Agnes Grey, which actually is, I think, really quite a good book. So they, they sent these three volumes out, they wrapped it up, they wrapped them up in brown paper, and they started sending them to publishers. And as it came back, and it kept coming back, they were so innocent that they just crossed out the name of the publisher and then sent it out again. <laughs> so, you know, by the time the eighth publisher got it, you know, it didn't look very good. Anyway, I don't know if that was, you know, because they really didn't have enough money to buy a new piece of paper, but I think they could have done that. Anyway, so finally, they do get a letter from this newbie, T.C. Newbie, who was rather an unscrupulous uh, publisher, it turned out. But he had some good sense. He read these three volumes uh, and wrote back and said, I, li I will take two. I'll take Wuthering Heights. He had the sense to realize, you know, that this was worth something. But you should make it longer. Angus Gray, yeah. mm -hmm. but not the professor. And so I do have a scene there where, and this is true, they had to make a decision. He also said, um, well, you, you'll have to pay, I think, 50 pounds or something, uh, uh, and then, you know, if I sell some books, I'll pay you back. So they had to put up the money, basically. Not exactly self-publishing, but along those lines. Uh, and um, anyway, I, I, in my scene, in my mind, Charlotte says to them, you, go, you have to go with it. It's the only offer we've had. You must accept it. Uh, although Emily was then asked to uh, fill in, basically, because they always published in three volumes, so she had to make up for the, you know, what wasn't there uh, by taking out Charlotte's book. Um, so, but she, ex Charlotte expects them to say no. I, anyway, in my version, you know, but of course they don't, they say yes. Uh, She's shocked that they betray her. She she really feels so distant. So I was that was I was wondering was that the part you made up? Uh, that her feelings. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. I don't know what she did. Uh -huh. Obviously, you you know those are the things that you don't know, and that nobody knows, and so that you can go for it. Uh, and, you know. In a way, it's useful to write about these Victorian figures because, though there were biographies written of them. Uh, like Mrs. Gaskell's uh, right, diary. Right, right. Nevertheless, because the, the convention was to write quite positive biographies of people, just the opposite of ours. I mean, we write these terrible pathographies of everybody. Now, everybody was abused with, by their father when they were trying, and everybody's an alcoholic. And, but, um, and if somebody doesn't have a totally miserable and, and, and also repellent life, they, they're, they're of no interest to us. But, 
but but in the 19th century, you know, Tennyson, for instance, would write a biography of his father that would just be totally worshipful from one end to the other. And that was the typical right. Victorian Mrs. biography. Yeah. And Mrs. Gaskell, of course, was, um, she really wanted to set the record straight because uh, Charlotte Bronte had been criticized by some, some of her critics said that her book was coarse and, you know, unfeminine and anti-Christian and anti-establishment. I mean, she'd be criticized, although it probably increased the sales. <laughs> uh, but anyway, she had received some critics like this. And I think the father, for one, wanted to set, set the record straight. And he was the one who asked Elizabeth Gaskell to write this, bi you know, her famous biography. So she turned Charlotte into a saint. Uh, in, uh, as you say, with nothing but, you know, pointing out. But that's out. fun for a modern novelist like you to yes. play off again. A little bit, yeah. a little bit, although of course there have been uh, others, other biographies of Charlotte Bronte, many, many uh, along the way. But there's always something one doesn't know, yes. That's right. And th I think that's maybe part of what's fun is to fill in these empty blanks. And right, and Ed has, has one wonderful scene too, which I, I wondered how documented that was, where Henry James comes to visit, and Cora, who is a, who's been a madam in a, in a brothel, right, from the Hotel right. Dream, and she's there, and this juxtaposition, he puts together uh, Henry James, you know, who's sort of, listening to this woman talk is just like receiving being slapped in the face and and she is just sort of saying it like it is you know and coming out with expressions that he finds terribly vulgar and this wonderful scene with this juxtaposition of these two opposites is just fantastic well i mean james uh, did, uh, did, he... did dislike her and he would refuse to visit after stephen crane died uh, he died at age 30 of tb and then poor Cora, who was a bit older, was stranded in London, uh, in England with no money. And she called on James, who was a sort of friend of theirs, and who had been a great friend of her husband, to uh, help her. But James wouldn't even return uh, her, her letter. You know, he was a terrible snob, and he didn't want to be seen with a compromised woman mm. like her. And uh, uh, so that was fun for me to write, because everybody, in these days is so worshipful of James. And I adore his writing, but he was a terrible prig, yeah. which you wouldn't gather from reading uh, Tom, Tom Toybin's The Master. But uh, although it's, a, I mean, I think it's one of the great uh, historical novels. I love that book. Very, very but, but it does yeah. present a strange view of James, I think. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, obviously his own view. Yeah. Yes, but well, one does that. One has to do yeah. that. No, you, exactly. you, know, you, you choose these figures that are real figures, uh, but then you have to imbue them with your own life and your own imagination, and you transform them in a way so that they become some place out there and kind of middle distance between you and reality, perhaps. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, uh, my, my book, Fanny, I, uh, which is largely about Frances Trollope, um, I, I saw her as sort of a stand-in for my own mother. I mean, uh, because my mother was very um, plucky, and she could survive absolutely anything. And, she, and one of her survival techniques was to not be very clear in her mind about what she thought about anything. I mean, she, <laughs> she was, I mean, I remember once saying to her, do you believe in, when I was like eight, I said, do you believe in uh, free will or um, <laughs> uh, determinism? And she said, a little bit of both. <laughs> And, and that's exactly what Mrs. Trollope would have said. She sees what she wants well, to yeah, see. Right. Should, should you think we should? Yes, let's, uh, does anybody have a question?